Hi, everybody. Hello. Um, so, so happy to have you here. Um, we're about to have a conversation with some really powerful, beautiful playwrights that National Black Theater is actually supporting within our 55th season, which is uh, entitled and themed Love, a Ritual of Repair. Um, and this conversation is really going to be looking at um, what does it mean for a playwright to truly uh, ground and center themselves as the architect and as a space of creating a sanctuary for our stories, for their stories, for our truth and for their truth to be illuminated. Um, it's going to be a conversation that helps to um, really um, uh, look at uh, what does it mean to create repair in a society. And I, we're just really excited at MBT to be looking at um, art from this vantage point. And I'm just deeply excited to have with us four dynamic voices in the American theater, um, voices that uh, I think um, everyone will truly, truly enjoy. One has already had their moment in the spotlight, Ty Lee. Um, but we, we have we have with us uh, today, Diane, AK, and Fedna. Um, so I'm just gonna bring them onto the stage so they could talk about a little bit who they are, um, but also so we can get right into the conversation uh, so we can also be able to glean from you some feedback. So if you have any questions for these folks, if you have any um, ideas that stimulate from their conversation, please, please, please write it in the chat. Um, we will definitely uplift it. We will definitely channel it through. Um, but without further ado, I bring to the stage uh, our four um, guests and our four beautiful artists that are part of our season. Hey, Diane. Hey, Fedna. Hey, AK. Hi. Hi, Lee. Hi. I feel like I feel like a little bit that I was like, um, what, what was that? What was that? I feel like I, it was like a um, like a club, like the Brady Bunch club. Like, hey, hey, hey. <laughs> I see you. Um, how are y'all doing? How are y'all doing? As December has just begun. Oh, and I just want to uplift that it is um, a great elders, uh, great ancestors of uh, birthday today, Frederica L. Tier, who was uh, Dr. Barbara Ann Tier's sister. Um, she was a Black Panther um, who helped to build the breakfast meal program that the Black, Black Panthers had. She was a social worker. Um, she was an institution builder. And so we're bringing to us to also curating the institution builders that help to really create these sanctuaries, right? Playwrights do that by the pins in which you occupy. So if you don't mind just taking a moment to just uh, give, let people know who you are, what pronouns you love to use, um, what excites you about, uh, about, about today and tomorrow and the future, um, and, uh, and what play, uh, MBT in particular, um, is producing of yours um, and maybe has already produced in the in the in the words of Tylee, but I'll take it away. Diane, do you mind going first? Absolutely. Um, I'm Diane Xavier. Uh, I'm she her pronouns. Um, and then she is co-producing my play Bernada's Daughters along with the new group. Um, and I'm really so excited, particularly with this play, um, to have it embodied in space. I've been working um, on it for uh, a, a number of years with my collaborator and amazing friend, um, Dominique Ryder. And it feels like our toddler is finally going to the first grade or something. Like, you know, it's real grades now, real depth, like real space. So I'm really excited about that. Ashe, Ashe. Fedna, you want to go? Sure. Uh, my name is Fedna. I use she, her pronouns. Um, the play that NBC, NBT is producing is called Black Mother Lost Daughter. Um, and I'm so excited for it in the spring. <laughs> I'm super excited for it. Um, it's a story very close to my heart. Um, and I'm so glad that, you know, people will be giving it life and breath. Um, let's see. What am I excited for today? I'm excited for my mom's cooking. <laughs> She's cooking some good Haitian food, bless her. And she's going to leave like so much so that I can have it for like the next week or two, which is awesome. Um, so that's what I'm looking forward to today. And of course, hearing all of you as part of the cohort, this wonderful, amazing cohort from MBT um, is also exciting for today. Ashe, Ashe. Ty Lee. Hey, everybody. My name is Ty Lee. And uh, MBT just recently produced a workshop production of my play, The Gospel Woman. And I'm excited about just being here with you all today and sharing some space with some great artists. Mm. AK. Hi everyone, I'm AK. Um, I use she and they pronouns. Uh, MBT is producing my show, Amani, uh, opening in February, 2023. 
Um, I'm so grateful to be here. And like, I'm really excited um, right now, just in the world about like finding ways to meld artistic practice and like wellness work um, and trying to find ways mm. to navigate peace and finding peace and enjoy. So that's who I am. I'm so excited to be here. Thank you. So AK, I mean, you're just jumping into a question that I, I would love to start to ruminate on. It's just like the idea of repair. Um, a, a National Black Theater season is themed love, a ritual of repair. Um, and when you think about your work and you think about the work that you're doing, not necessarily the plays that we are producing, but just like the work that you do and the pins that, the how your pin articulates different worlds, structures and characters, um, what needs to be repaired? How does your work help to fall into that conversation? Um, what ways are you trying to tackle that notion of repair? Um, if you, if anyone, please, if you feel inspired by the question, if you don't mind just picking up and asking and answering the question of what does repair look like um, in within the context of your creative work? I have polite people on this Zoom because they all like, I don't know yet, who gonna go? I see, I see AK, you're about to take the lead, so go ahead. Yeah, I mean, I was going to offer that I think a lot about repair in relation to I'm really passionate about like navigating abolition and talking about like restorative justice. So I think a lot about repair in that way and about ways that we can like bridge divides that have been rendered by the prison industrial complex and like how to create space uh, for folks who have been incarcerated or are formerly incarcerated. Um, yeah, to, 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 to navigate storytelling. Um, so yeah, somebody who's been affected by that system, like I'm really passionate about like how we can navigate repair in terms of like witnessing um, and seeing folks uh, who have who have been affected by that system in particular. Mm -hmm. so that's the way that I think about it. That's really lovely. You know, I, um, I feel like this is gonna come up uh, repeatedly for me this afternoon. So forgive me for it like sounding like a broken, record from the jump, but when I think of repair, I think of rehearsal. And I know for me, when I when I write, and especially when I get into a room with, with folks, this like opportunity, these chances to try something again and again um, is, how I, is how I think about repair in terms of something that I can actually, I can actually manage. I think sometimes, at least personally, repair feels like, oh my God, I gotta get it perfect this time, right? Like I get a second chance and now this really has to be it. But when I think of rehearsal, it's never, it has to be it. Like it's it's a thing of like you're, you're in process and you're going again and again and you're going from a different angle with a different voice at a different tone at a different speed. And it seems to me that if we're gonna try to do this work of um, getting over, of forgiveness, of, um, restarts of refreshes that that the attempt can be uh, multiple. Mm. What I re I just want to really uplift this idea of repair being a rehearsal um, because I think that we uh, uh, living in a dominant culture that lives in cap that frames itself by capitalism, <laughs> perfectionism, and complete and finite exactly. is where we kind of like live. And this idea of releasing, um, this idea of repair as being this finite thing, but this thing that we get to rehearse um, over and over and over again um, and releasing ourselves into that. I think that, I mean, that warmed my heart. <laughs> that, 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 helped me, that helped me to really think, oh, I have a chance at something, right? I don't, I, I, and, and to have the opportunity to be wrong. Um, I think exactly. I think sometimes we don't give ourselves the permission for that wrongness, whatever that might mean. It feels icky. It feels nasty. Like no, 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 no. And like there might be an opportunity for us to be wrong because we're in rehearsal. Mm, um, right. When we read it from a space of rehearsal. There's not wrong. There's just language of learning. Right. We're learning about ourselves as humans. We're learning about each other in relationship. And I'm gonna be quiet because I'm supposed to be just moderating. Fedna, you got off mute. Go ahead. <laughs> yes, I. Uh, Diane, that was brilliant. I I'm gonna borrow that only because that just touched me so hard. I I, especially as an actor, like rehearsal is like my love language you know like I love being in a rehearsal I love practicing trying new things and I've never translated that or tried to transfer that into a writing space when I have like the writer's cap on right 
and oh. that's brilliant. So I'm sorry, it just kind of <laughs> blew my mind. I'm Keep like, yeah, it. Right. Keep it. take it. <laughs> yes, of course, and also with life too, you know, seeing certain things as rehearsal rather than needing to be perfect or on point mm-hmm. all the time. Like, why? Where's the fun in that? Because rehearsal is the best. Um, <laughs> so, <laughs> I'm gonna steal that. Uh, but also, um, in terms of your question, Jonathan, I think. For me, um, I like to focus my work on breaking points, right? Like when we reach the breaking points and when we realize that we actually need to repair, that we need healing. Mm -hmm. And I think that's actually very, it's a tricky thing, right? Because I do think, you know, we're all the superstars in our own minds and we can get a little delusional and we don't know when we actually need help, when we need healing, when we're in a bad place. Um, So I try to write a bunch of broken characters and see what happens when you put them in a room and when they could recognize things in each other and then thus recognize things in themselves, right? Um, And that is where I think that ritual of repair comes in. And I'm so blessed that I have this home with MBT that myself as a writer can investigate that in a community of love peace and patience, right? So that myself, like I'm never at a breaking point while I'm writing. Mm. So much patience and love during this process and great feedback, Mm. right? So like I'm in such a steady, safe place that I can put my characters like to the fire, you know, and really help them realize where they need to navigate in order to find that healing. Well, what, what, what actually is really important about what you're uplifting, Fedna, and I, I'll take it as a, a nice feather in MBT's cap, is this notion of um, everything can't be bro- breaking. Mm-hmm. Everything can't be on fire. Something has to be comforted mm-hmm. and safe. Something has to be held. And, and, um, and when I think about every one of your pieces, uh, there are pieces where humans are, bro- are, are, are at their max of their breaking, um, and uh, it's quite beautiful to think about my responsibility as part of the institution, part of the home space of creating the conditions that the walls or the container or the um, conditions in which your playground is set up in. Um, it's my responsibility uh, to make sure that you, as the architect of this moment, are also not breaking, that you are held in a space where I, where, where your pin can can dream into dark spaces, um, yet you are not dark. Um, yes. And so then there, mm. your light is still blazing past um, the ruptures that your humans um, are, imbo- are embodying. So I, I really, really appreciate that. Ty Lee, anything that you wanna say adding to that, to, to that question? Uh, well, I have a, an investigative sensibility. So I, I tend to focus on relatively unsung stories and I think there's some repairing in the process of, of you know, what I'm writing about. Um, mm. Yeah, who I choose to center, what I choose to center, um, and what I am interested in contributing to the canon. And when we and when we think and when we think about all of that gumbo and all of that soup, my my, my question is. Um, because I think, Tylee, you, you uplift this, and I think that all of you, were, we've been scratching at this, is that what do we place value in? Um, I think Adrian Me Brown um, has this beautiful uh, part of emergent strategy, what you pay attention to grows, um, mm. and, 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 and how what we pay attention to does grow. So like, Tylee, you pay attention to the unsung, um, unsung uh, narratives, people, histories, allows us to grow in our appreciation for them um, and, and vice versa. We talk about it all together. What is what is that commitment that I see that ha- is housed in all four of your works? Um, is that something that is durational to this project? Is that something that is, um, Tylee, you ta- uplifted in, maybe you want to take this uh, question first. Is that something that actually is restorative inside of all your works? Is that a commitment that you have to everything that you're doing? But what is this um, language, this uh, kind of fortitude around um, investigating uh, the unsung, unseen. Um, what does that mean to you, and how, do, and how does your and how does your work reflect uh, that commitment? Uh, when I'm teaching, I, I tell my students like I think a playwright has to pay attention, and that, that has to be organically a part of who they are. That you're just an observant person organically. And you also have to like people enough to want to tell their stories. <laughs> um, so I just think it's something that you're born with. Um, yeah. 
Does this question resonate with anyone else before we move on? Yeah, yeah. I, Kylie, that thing of uh, paying attention, um, I can't help but think about uh, Irene Fornes, the, the really, um, oh my God, an amazing documentary about her um, called The Rest I Make Up. Sorry, I had to find it in my head for a second. So I didn't want to just say that title. It's a very, it's a really, really great um, film. Um, and at one point, she has a note. Um, it's at a time of her life where she's uh, been suffering from dementia for a few years. So she has all these notes around her apartment. And one of the notes says, love is paying deep attention. And mm -hmm. I, I, like, ever since I saw that, I haven't thought about love or attention, especially as it comes to the craft of writing the same. Like, love really is paying deep attention. And I think it takes, at least for me, takes it out of this sort of, you know, this thing of like saccharine or too sweet or even sentimental, right? Like being attentive is a very active thing to do. Mm. Like it's a thing that like takes your body, it takes all of your senses. It's about like a sort of like narrowing focus. And to me that feels very athletic. It feels totally corp corporeal, right? And so like if I'm going to do the thing of writing I have to pay attention even to the characters and parts of the story that I don't love right or I don't like or don't make me feel good I still have to care for them in some way I still have to I still have to love them because I still have to see them around all sides um and I just, I just wanted to kind of like um yeah pull into uh, pull what you were saying into the space a little bit I, I think that's so important and it's a thing that you can really attached to craft. And so when I'm telling my, uh, you know, I teach too, and I'm telling my students, like, how can you pay attention to this thing? It's not because it's your favorite part of the story. It's because it, it it's because you you need to sort of see, see all the sides. Hmm. Hmm. Other, other, other points that want to potentially be brought up, AK, Edna, yeah. Yeah, I wanted to, just wanted to thank you, Diane, for bringing in Fernandez, one of my favorite playwrights ever. And like, I think that, that note of like, of, of her, her idea of attention and the way that she like, I feel like her whole practice of like, holding a room or holding space, like for like a single thing to happen on stage is so exciting to me. Cause I think yeah. a lot of people, like rest and abundance and like mm -hmm. rest and abundance for black characters on stage, like, what does it mean to see two people loving each other for like a long time and for that to feel infinite, like for that to really mm. take place in a world where like there often are not images of that that we're inundated with. Like, what does it mean to craft um, to craft that so that it might grow, so that it's like a seed that's growing out or, or expanding? Um, it's really exciting to me. I, and I love this idea of what does it mean to have us witness rest as an active form of creative placemaking. And yeah. us actually being able to sit with black bodies as a restful space instead of a, um, a triaged, uh, active, muscular dexterity kind of space. Um, mm -hmm. And I, I would love for you to expand on that just a little bit more, AK. Because I, 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 and I, and I, and I would love that you expand it more because of what I know of Amani and what Amani does as a, as a vehicle um, and a piece that people will be able to experience. This idea of what does it mean to create. Um, the intimate silent spaces of inactivity that's truly active, right? We think of it as inactivity, but really, like sometimes we're like silence is so boring, but silence is so powerful um, when activated properly. So do you mind just talking about that just a little bit more around that idea and that theology of rest that you have brought into the space um, and how that or is a part of that restorative no notion um, of helping to show up the dynamism of who we are and how we show up. And just wanna say plug, if anyone has questions as you're listening to this, please uh, put them into the chat. We will be uh, raising them and bringing them into the room. Um, we welcome you into the space. This is the National Black Theater hosting a conversation with our beautiful playwrights for the season um, and allowing for them to articulate how they're generating the restorative sanctuary that builds in love as a ritual of repair. AK, I, I put the floor back to you after my plug. Yeah, um, thank you for that question. I like, I, I love talking about rest. So I could do this for a long time. So I think like, um, I mean, I, I, I don't know if y'all have heard of the Nat Ministry on Instagram, some of my favorite pages. Uh, so just plugging that. But I think a lot about, uh, particularly in Amani, uh, the play is about um, a father and daughter who are building a rocket ship to go to space. 
um, and and the, the daughter sort of finding her own journey to space uh, later on. Um, but I'm really interested in like the sort of distance between like labor and work and 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 how 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 there are like how to balance the sort of idea of like purposeful labor and also like of like rest that feels needed and 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 space to like sort of expand on that if that makes any sense um but the notion of like of like rest being a part of the idea of, of doing labor that is aligned with purpose uh mm -hmm. is really important to me um because I, I i think a lot about like about how restful even the work that i'm doing feels because it feels aligned with like the purpose that i'm in and also knowing how to like take a breath and like be present in the moment that i'm in in order to like to, to not let it pass me if that makes sense and, and how important mm -hmm. for, for black life in the midst of like so much that that has tried to dehumanize our us and and, and dehumanize our capacity to like to 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 be and to be present and to and to live so yeah scattered thoughts and and in, in rehearsal but no yeah. scattered thoughts no, no, totally no. Beautiful <laughs> thoughts Go ahead, hey, Diane. Hey, I could just jump on that um, for a second because that thing of like aligning, right? Aligning, I, you said it so beautifully, but right, you're sort of aligning, aligning your purpose with the labor for it. That actually redefines labor, right? That like it's like work becomes something different. And I cannot help but think of Sadia Hartman's book, Wayward Lives. Because I forget the second, but I'm, I'm trying to remember the second part of the title, Wayward Lives, Beautiful, beautiful Experiments. Yes. yes. And there's this whole section, it's such a beautiful book, but there's this whole section where she's talking about these young Black women who would be arrested because they weren't doing anything, right? They weren't laboring or working in the way this white supremacist system thought that they should be. And so you get you get in trouble with the law because you're loitering, because you're right, because you're just living your life. You're just like doing mm -hmm. your thing. And I, I I really think about like what you're talking about in terms of a kind of refusal, right? Like what happens when you decide to prioritize your rest and so that your labor could look like something else. And mm -hmm. when that something else is illegible to the state, how suddenly you become a troublesome person, right? You're no longer working within a citizenry that is totally devoted to capitalism. And that is trouble. That is not what we're supposed to look like. Um, and it just creates these like little sort of like these weird lapses or these little glitches in, in the system, right? That we that I feel like, particularly for me, Black fans and um, Black people in like in total, but especially Black fans, from Black friends to the jump food. Hmm. Benna, is there something that you, I, 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 I feel something coming in. No, I was just nodding. Yes, 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 <laughs> yes. yes, and yes. So, so, uh, so, Fedna, I do have a question that I would love for you to jump off because um, I, I love the way the room is cooking. Um, is this notion around it's around ancestors and how and when I think and when I think about when I think about the work uh that that you pinned black mother lost daughter um the ghost of our ancestors but also the presence of our ancestors and the and the force of our ancestors um do you mind just talking about how your ancestors reflect and drive your work um where the push and levers happen in the manifestation of how um your particular work uh black mother lost daughter shows up but then also just how you operate in the world because that's what i love where this conversation is going it's not about necessarily the production at hand it's about you as the human that we you get to invest in um, through the work that you ultimately do create? Yes. Um, so I guess I'll talk about myself first and then the play. Um, for myself, I just feel incredibly lucky to be where I am now and to be able to be an artist, right? I think if you look at my life, um, like where my parents came from and the generation that I'm in, like it would seem like I'd be the one that like would have that like dirty job, you know, and like able to like do all this stuff. Like I would have taken that road, like the doctor lawyer, that's kind of what was expected of my generation being first generation. Um, and I didn't, you know, um, and I just kind of took a plunge, became an artist and I'm fine. You know, my family's fine. Everyone's fine. Everyone's happy. And that 
I just feel incredibly lucky. And I think part of the reason why I was able to do that is because, you know, I do listen to my ancestors, right? Like I do try to be that voice of the generations that came before me that couldn't, that didn't have the privilege to do what I'm doing right now, right? Like I constantly talk to my mother about my grandmother and like all of her dreams and the things that, you know, she wanted to accomplish, but she was doing this, right? And then my mother herself, you know, coming from a different country and working three jobs and doing all this stuff, you know, just to like get food on the table. And, you know, she's like, yeah, uh, you know, she came to my play uh, yesterday and she's like, you know. It's not just, it's not just like some old plays. Like, <laughs> let's uplift, let's uplift that a little bit more. Fedna just made her Broadway debut. We ain't no mo. All right, so let's. Is that, I mean, every place yeah. opening is important, but congratulations on that beautiful moment and achievement. We, it's just, I just wanna. We should give it just a little bit more frame than. than okay. Thank you. Thank you. I appreciate it. But my mom, you know, she like right after she was like, yeah, you know, like. I used to do plays in Haiti, like, and then she was explaining like the plays that she used to do with her friends, you know? And she was explaining the quick changes and how she understood how quick my change was because she used to do this like quick change thing. And I'm like, oh my gosh, you know, like here I am like living this life, right? That I could see the seeds from my ancestors, my, my, my immediate ancestors. So okay. that's always been important in my life. And I think in um, Black Mother Lost Daughter, it, it kind of changes the form of what we look as a term of ancestors, right? Because it's a little more recent, a little more close, a little less aged, a little less rooted. Um, we're looking at, you know, people who've just recently passed and what that effect has on us that are still here, but also on our memory of what happened before. And I think that space has been such a lovely space to explore. And I think it's it's the first time I've actually explored it because I've had the time to, you know. Mm -hmm. um, this is the first play in which I get to like play with that and really see what happens and trial and error, rehearse a little bit, you know, change the ending here, put it back, you know, later, um, just to see what it actually looks like and feels like. So yes, definitely ancestral work is super important to me. And now I feel like it's it's being updated. With mm -hmm. the Hmm. And does that question speak to anyone else in this tribe and group? If it does, please chime on in. Yeah. Yes. Well, uh -huh. I was going to ask Penna if you did you know about your mom's plays before? I knew like, that she's spoken about it before. Well, she does. She sings. She's like a really great singer. So she oh, sings. Wow. At and so okay. she do like kind of church pageants in a way like when i was mm -hmm. like i went to church like at, back in boston like her choir would do like a play and she'd be like mary the mother of jesus you know <laughs> so i usually do that maybe like once every two years but no yeah. i didn't know that back in haiti my mama was just like, right? on the stage. like you know the thing here's my thing I, the ancestors really be like keeping all these secrets and I, I just asked you about it because I had a similar thing happen where my mom a few years ago um she passed away in 2018 uh, rest in peace but when I was in grad school I was doing a workshop production of my final thing and she came to see it it was in New York and so she's like you know bringing her sister and, and you know for several years it was like oh, I don't know what Diane is doing in, in school. I don't know what's going on. Oh, I don't know what these things are. And then she sees the production and we're having dinner afterwards. And she's like, yeah, you know, when we were younger, we would put on our shows and we would do the costumes. And my mind was totally blown, right? Mm -hmm. And so these, I just, you described it so beautifully, but these risks that you end up taking because you're a person mm. who is trying to respect the love and care that your ancestors gave you, right? You want to live out your life to the fullest because of that. And so you take these risks and you end up being an artist and you feel a little crazy at first because it's not the safe bet. But then because of these sort of creative risks you've taken, it actually opens up space for these ancestors and these people who have come before you to just share a little bit of when they were able to be freed, when they were able to tell their own stories in their own ways. And it's just like such a beautiful thing to hear about from you because it creates this like new connection to your mother that you might not have had before. And that would look so different had you done something that looks a little bit more conventional or had you 
taken, you know, just a route that is a bit more sort of so I just wanted to celebrate like you and and your family for that. But AK, please. <laughs> Aki was going to get us into her, uh, an how ancestry works in her work. <laughs> yeah, I was just going to offer. I mean, I'm I love this this question, and I want to thank you for it because I've never had the space to actually talk about how ancestors inform work before, like ever. So I, yeah, I just want to thank you for that first of all. Um, but just this idea of like ancestral affirmations, they feel so present, like in all of the, what we're talking about. Like I think a lot about. Mm -hmm. um, about, so I was working on a show a couple months ago that was uh, collecting his oral histories from my grandmother um, and like and 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 sort of thinking about uh, time and lineage and queerness and like narratives that like did not get to be told um, in her life and like thinking so much about like about like the, the weight that that has of like carrying these histories but also like like living into the present, like living those dreams or living those like moments in the present are like, it's so resonant for me. And there's many moments of like quiet affirmation that like don't always get space because of the sort of cultures that we're in that like don't always like recognize what those affirmations mean. Um, so I'm, I'm really interested in like that idea of like how we can hold that kind of space and how we can like listen to those affirmations when they occur, as opposed to like sort of silencing them, but really heeding them. Um, as sort of guideposts along the way, they, they they feel so so resonant and important. I mean, they're they're one of the most essential secret sauces to actually living a full life. I mean, yeah. I mean, I think I think I think that I think that the four of you, I'm a pri I, the five of us, I'll include myself into it. Um, there are so many different ways that we took different roads because we listened, um, and those mm. different roads that we took because we listened awakened so much more doors, so many more new doors, new opportunities, new spaces. Um, there's uh, that, that beautiful thing that like, it's in the silence that you hear God, like it's in the whisper that you hear source. It's in that space that that in between that you hear that lineage. Um, and I always love to say this is that like, I'm at the best when I'm just completing the unfin unfinished sentences of my ancestors. Like I'm in the, I'm at the best of my life. I'm doing the best thing possible when I'm just putting that period or I'm just placing that dot over that I or I'm crossing that T that, that, that they didn't get to complete. Like I'm at the best when I do that. And if my life is a summation of just that dot, just that cross of that T, just that I, that dot over the I, hey, what a profound gift that I gave to, the, to, to my bloodline to my to my wisdom keepers, to the people who helped to craft and build me, um, who thought about me, who envisioned me. Um, uh, I, I just finished, and I'll get off the soapbox. I want to hear from Ty Lee, but there, 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 I just finished doing a show in um, in Sweden called A Drop of Midnight, and it was about heritage and this notion of like how how powerful it is to really sit with the fact that people envisioned us mm. who didn't know us. People envisioned our this conversation that that might happen before they even got to know us. And they might not have known all the things that we were going to say. They might not know all the identities that we were going to accompany or say that we were a part of. They probably not didn't know the, the, the color of the sweatshirt that we're wearing or the jewelry that we have. But they envisioned there were vessels that they could live and breathe life into that would carry mm -hmm. elements of their bloodline and what a privilege it is to be a part of that wisdom keeping. And like, then my question becomes, who am I envisioning? Who am I giving space to envision for, the vision with? Who do we do that on a day-to-day -day basis? Um, I think that's something that I'm always consistently kind of like interested in and just like, how is the tilling of the ground that we do? And as you in particular, as, uh, as playwrights, who I, 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 I don't envy you in the way that you are the anthropologists of our generation, right? You are, you, you are the folks that, that when people look back at, at who we were, what we cared about, what we do, they're gonna look at your plays. They're gonna read the texts that you gave attention to. They're gonna read the things that me as a producer invested in and say, oh, that's what they cared about. Oh, that's what they, that's what meant to, that's what society, that's what love looked like to them, or that's what loss looked like to them, or that that's what gentrification like, or that's what capitalism, that's what this moment of rupture of civic unrest meant to them. Um, and so it becomes a real huge, beautiful opportunity of you envisioning like, what do you want that future to 
live into, speak into, care about. Um, but Ty Lee, uh, how does ancestry, how does any of this conversation, how is that resting in you? What are things that are showing up inside of your body, inside of your spirit? Yeah, I mean, you know what? My plays are also gripped by biography. Um, it doesn't really matter what the subject is. I have to find my my way in somehow. And I usually do that through biography, whether it's my biography or someone in my family's biography who I can place in a time period. That's how I get into the work. Um, but in terms of ancestors, I'm really interested in concretizing oral history like the everyone else was saying. Um, and channeling my ancestors, but sometimes just saying that alone isn't enough. Um, my process is really getting to them by uh, paying attention and listening to my predecessors who are still living. And they kind of open a window to my ancestors. So it's not like I'm just, just lighting incense and channeling my ancestors. I'm actually talking to the people who are alive and who can actually introduce me to their stories. And then I follow, follow that. Love it, love it, love it, love it. So I, I will, uh, oh, go ahead. I'm sorry, I just wanted to offer one additional thing that I think like, I was thinking so much about, cause a lot of my practice in like oral history methodology and like looking at like, like black histories and talking to family revolves around pictures and like images. And I think so much in what you were saying, Jonathan, around like um, envisioning a future, um, a friend of mine uh, had mentioned like, when I was thinking about, about these pictures that somebody, in order to take a picture and file it somewhere or keep it somewhere, it's actively like it's a medium of the future. Like it's all about like who is going to see this next and what are they going to make of it, which I find like so resonant and interesting in thinking through like how we like how how the how pictures and like I think in in moving from like creating embodied narratives around around imagery um, is such like a rich way to think about how people actually physically envisioned um, and envisioned life mm -hmm. for themselves. Uh, envision somebody picking up an image uh, or picking up an object or whatever form they left behind uh, as a way to imagine a future. Well, what I also love about what you're what, what you're uplifting and it leads into my next question is that like ancestry doesn't necessarily uh, have to be connected to bloodline. Ancestry has to be connected to a willingness to accept the curiosity. And if someone can accept the curiosity of what um, you've been brought into, so i.e. I pick up a picture, I want to know who that person is, where that person came from, how do they breathe, and then we get a story about Henrietta Lacks, then we get a story about Frederick Douglass, then we get a story about all of these, uh, uh, like um, Mary Bacall Bethune or, or, or Harriet Tubman or, or Dr. Barbara Antier, these people who are not necessarily connected to the bloodline that is tethered to de necessarily you, but they're tethered to the connectivity of your ability um, to be a part of humanity, right? That source energy. And I, and I, and I, think, and I think that what I love about all of you and what this conversation is uplifting is a sacred act of being able to create the sacred act of being able to write a play um, that sometimes we don't give space to to your point ak we don't sometimes don't want to give so much space to like the ancestry or magic or spirituality of it all um yet this is a very spiritual act uh what you all do what people engage with is something that speaks to the hearts and minds of who they are um and if that's not what spirituality does among multiple different other things um then what is it doing um so so just thinking about thinking about laying the foundation um as AK, you kind of talked about that when you said picking up the piece, of, uh, picking up the photo. Um, what are some tools that you need to build your dream space? And um, what are some fundamental tools that you need to build your dream space when you're starting to write a play, when you're starting to build a play? Um, I think that there are folks that are listening to this that might be aspiring playwrights, might be interested in trying to uh, look at this um, or try to be like, oh, I want to try to do what they're talking about. That feels really exciting. Um, can you just speak a little bit to like, what are some of the fundamental ways in which you start to navigate navigate in. Ty Lee talked about this a little bit, but I think we can all expand a little bit more into the that brain space. For me, um, and this is actually really pretty simple, but I find my stories in life and then I have to leave time to daydream and dream about it, right? Because when I attack a play in a authoritarian nature, like I'm going to write you, it always comes off weird um, and uninspired, right? Rather than when I'm inspired by an idea and then I say, you know what? I have 20 minutes right now. Let me just sit in my room, close the lights and like daydream about this thought, right? 
that's when it comes to me. That's when it starts speaking to me. When I think about it before I go to sleep, I wake up and that's how the story always comes. And those are the ones that I'm like, yes, yes, I love it. Um, so I literally actually dream in order mm. to write these stories. Mm. Others that might be inspired by this question or might want to address this question and they have another one to ask. Yeah, that's really amazing, Prima. You, it's And you really do have to give your time, yourself time to do that. It's so true. It's, it's fear trying to do the right on command thing. Like that is not the same as answering emails. They're, they are very different uh, practices. And as a person who used to work in arts administration, I also value correspondence and making sure everything's happening, but that is not the same as sitting down and giving that expansive time to just dream into something. Um, for me, it takes, I need a question, like I need to start with a question and a map. Like geography is really important to how I conceptualize um, narrative. And mm. so if I know a little bit about the where, and it doesn't even necessarily need to mean like actual like city, whatever it is. I, I, there is some sort of mapping that I need to start to figure out before I can start writing. Um, and that might be helpful for maybe visual or spatial thinkers. Like often it's really the, the connections or the web of things that gets me, that gets me really going. Anyone? Oh, yeah, go ahead, AK. Yeah, I was going to offer, um, it is kind of a story, but I, so I um, I went to like a public arts high school, like I'm a sort of magnet public school, just amplifying that because I feel like public schools don't get a lot of space, um, but naming that. And uh, at this school, we we weren't allowed to like listen to music while we were writing. I was a writing major and I was always so upset about it, but it really informed my practice because I think the way that I write and the way that I create my dream space is like through deep listening. Um, like I like I don't, I can't listen to anything else. Like I have to listen to the rhythm of the play or the rhythm of the character. So I write through that. And I think like that's really intrinsic to my process. Um, I'm also the child of a music teacher, which is like important to how I think about world building as well. Um, but I think a lot about the cadence of how people like listening for that and like not letting anything else cloud how I'm thinking about or cloud how that character or that ancestor or whoever is coming through. Um, and so like I often write with like earbuds to like help me sort of just like be in an illusion of silence or like numbed sound. Uh, there's like elements of my practice that I'm still building and like finding. Um, but I really do track it back to that early moment of being like, I don't, I don't, I'm mad because I can't listen to music in class uh, while I'm writing. Um, yeah, and also just like embodiment. I really am passionate about like being in the body and having space to move. Um, also drawing back to Fornes, like I think she was really about like being in the body while writing and that they're not separate entities, the mind and the body. So um, yeah, I, I really just try to like bring that into my practice and think about how my body is involved in the work. Tylee. Yeah, I mean, they're saying it all, but I, <laughs> in addition to like process and, and craft, playwrights need time, professional time, developmental resources, and money to write. <laughs> so the next, so, so a question that came from the interwebs, the folks out there who are listening to us, um, can you share about completing your work in those times of procrastination, writer's block, and fear of success. <laughs> That's a hard. I think it goes back to what Tylee was saying, right? Like you, <laughs> writers need space, time, and um, support. It really, it really does often come down to that. I, I often think about finishing the. Like, or not finishing, ending the play before it's done. Like sometimes I will just like decide this is the ending for now because you can you can always rehearse the writing of another ending. I think we sort of mm -hmm. talked a little bit about that before when I mentioned rehearsal. But sometimes we, as a write as writers, we get into this weird thing of like, okay, and this is the bow that wraps up the entire thing. But what happens if you rehearse like five different endings for your play and you just pick a week and that week you're writing, you're doing like very sort of, you know, a fa fast endings 
and you don't commit to any of them and you just write each one out and see what happens after you've rested for a bit. Like we, we get so clamped up by the time we're, we're at the end of a project that it does feel like everything is writing on that final word before end play. And I'm always trying to sort of self-sabotage ways out of that. Yeah, yeah. I think for me, like whenever I get into a procrastination rut um, and I have a deadline, um, I have to remind myself that editing is fun, right? So what I, <laughs> yeah, cause it's not really, sometimes you just have to worry about, like you could worry about it in editing. So you get yourself a treat, right? Like whether that's like a chocolate cake, a slice of chocolate cake or some ice cream, like some talenti, whatever, you buy it, right? You put it in the refrigerator, you have a note on it and it's like, hey, if I don't finish this 15 pages by the end of the day, I don't get this treat. So you're gonna write those 15 pages, you're gonna get your slice of cake, right? and you have it and it's done and like that hurdle is gone and then the next day you look at it and you know you're you're your best critic you know when you you're like mm, that line i wish it was like this and then you get to the fun part which is editing and so you can just adjust the 15 pages but it's already done so it it opens up another part of your brain that is sometimes more creative uh more lax funnier right who get to the point quicker and then you you approach it from a different way, right? Like so, it's just don't don't fight your body, right? Give your body what it wants, what it needs, and find a different avenue to get to the same place. Ashe. don't fight your body. Mm -hmm. Yes, AK. Yeah, I was gonna say, and I think there's like with a caveat of like it, this is very hard to like, I guess, navigate around a deadline and around something that's like actively there. But I think for me at least. It, it sometimes it's easier to complete work when I release the idea that I like, that it's like my work to like, that it's sort of like this thing that I have like ownership or I have to wrangle. And I think Fedna, you talked about that a little bit too, of like releasing like this, yeah, like, like releasing the sense that this is like, this is something that I have like, like individual ownership over and trusting that like the the story is going to speak when it needs to speak if that makes any sense like it'll it's gonna happen and and I think in moments where I've tried to um, I've tried to 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 complete things because of the deadlines that exist it, and and I'm like overdoing that I often am 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 less successful at actually getting it done so I think it's like counterintuitive like a sort of idea of like by releasing I actually am more successful at navigating. The, the completion of it and trusting that like like act like moving with kindness towards myself too in that whole process yeah moving towards kindness i love all of this this makes me feel very good tylee do you have anything you want to add i think procrastination is an attribute of someone's character if it shows up in your career it probably shows up in other areas of your life and you can just address it the same way you do in other areas um i think fear is healthy but you shouldn't get stuck there I don't use the term writer's block. I think if you just are done working that day as a writer, just understand you're done and the, and the story needs space. But I don't like to keep using or recycling that term writer's block. I don't think it's a good thing. Appreciate that. I think that's really important. Next question from the interwebs. Thank you very much for bringing them in, y'all. Um, does anyone recommend books, classes to improve your process skill for people not in a theater program? So what are some what are some things that you would lean, lean or lean into? Um, y'all are some well-versed, well-skilled humans. So uh, come on, drop drop some gems for the for the for the interwebs. I am happy to jump in on this because I always describe myself as the lead theater person involved in theater. It's like I am terribly cool. I'm like a bad theater student. You know, like I didn't read all the stuff I was supposed to read. I just deeply believe in storytelling. And like I think sometimes, especially as Black theater artists, there is a way in which we can get, um, we can sort of enter um, you know, more conventional theater spaces or sort of traditional theater spaces or to be quite frank, theater spaces for white people and suddenly be put in, in this sort of like, did you, do you know these plays? Did you read these things? Do you know that show? Um, and it's like, that's not even the thing, right? It's like, how, how committed am I to telling these stories? For me, taking poetry classes is always the thing. Like the way that poets engage with the word is so 
like the word at a really fundamental level is so it's like a vocation i mean it becomes like this sort of like religious experience like there's a kind of focus and a return to the word to the line to punctuation that sometimes you know players can kind of get away with a with a lot that ends up getting fixed in rehearsal and so i i, I really appreciate the rigor that poets operate with in terms of getting language on the page because they are trying to get the language to do something in the world that is maybe a little different from what we do. Um, and then the other thing is reading nonfiction books. So there's this really great book by um, Melissa Feeble called Bodywork. And it's kind of like a, a short nonfiction mem memoir, but it ends up being about writing so much. And I love hearing other writers describe their relationship to writing so that I can then think about my relationship to playwriting. Sometimes when it's too close to the subject itself, you don't have the space to draw comparisons. So I would say look at writers from other genres and think about you know, their relationships to writing and then reflect on your own writing in terms of writing for the stage. Other folks. Yeah, I think it's important to dive into what you love, right? I love watching TV. And if you talk to my husband, like when we first met, he's like, wow, you watch a lot of TV. And I was like, oh no, this is work. And it is, and it is, it's work. Um, I love watching TV and I love finding stories that ugh, hit me. And that includes documentaries, right? But most of the time I think, oh man, like, but what if like this person was black? You know what I mean? Like, what if this story was like a little different, right? And so that inspires me, right? But so like maybe I'm watching a movie and I love the way the pacing is just like fast paced, like everyone's speaking at a speed that's a little um, faster than thought, which is my favorite thing, right? So that inspires me, right? And I'm like, yeah, but this story, you know, is maybe about England and like, you know, some like maid downstairs and like the Lord or lady upstairs. And like, I'm not gonna write about that. Right. But if I, I could write about something else that I know that I love with that same pacing. Right. So I think the more you dive into what you love, like if you love reading books or if you love doing this, it doesn't have to be a particular thing. As long as you love it and can borrow from it, you're good. Other folks. Yeah, I think they should go see and read all of our plays. Diane's play, Fedna's play, AK's play, my play. Um, because you have to also see theater to really learn about theater, for real. Um, but in addition to that, the Playwright Center, where I am right now, offers classes to students who are not in college um, for very little uh, charge. If you go to theplaywrightcenter.com, you can see kind of what we offer here as well. <clears throat> Yeah, and I, I was just going to second what, what Fedna was saying. I mean, I just emphasizing because I feel like trusting that is often really hard. Like, I'm a shameless, shamefully, I guess, a huge fan of The Crown. <laughs> As you were describing that, I was like, yes. Um, but yeah, I think like trusting what you love, like, and, and I just, just extending that outward, like not judging it. You know what I mean? Because I feel like a lot of times in culture, it's like, oh, you can't like this because you're supposed to fit into this box and you're supposed to do this. Like, but really trusting, like, this is who I am and like, this is what I love and like that being okay and like really leaning into that, I think is really important. So I'm yeah, gonna... and also oh, just, go ahead, Diane. Go ahead, one Diane. more. Also, seeing theater to Tylee's point, like seeing theater, you can afford. There are so many like great college produ productions of things, like community productions of things. But I think people, me included, feel a pressure to see the whatever is the most award nominated or whatever is on everybody's tongue, and that's great, fine. But I feel like. The, most of the shows that I remember seeing were just really small houses where people were just doing this thing they really love because they were doing it with people who also love it. And that can be a little different sometimes than, um, you know, super commercial stuff. So then my last question before we round out our time together, can you imagine it's already been an hour? Um, if, I, if you could instantly change something or 
morph or evolve something within the black community, what would it be? Um, uh, they, uh, yep, they said, and boom, we walk out of the theater. They said, it, what would the play be about? And then boom, the change happens. You write it, and then boom, it happens. What would that be? Um, it could be one word, two words, and then I have my last round out question um, as we as we uh, leave each other for from this Friday. That's such a crazy question. Again, I don't even it, know it, hey, hey, that. hey, the world, the world <laughs> might be a little crazy and need that kind of... It's true. We do, you know, things are wild in these streets. <laughs> so my word would be space, but it would have to be like a sort of like just, and I, I mean space in terms of like resources, rooms, like money access, but also like space in terms of like just letting people be themselves, like letting people show up how they are, like yeah, just throwing out all of the boxes that we have to fit in or people say we mm -hmm. have to fit in, like that would be all encapsulated in the word space for me. I'm gonna get in on that because I'm thinking about like more space of like a, a theater, culturally specific theater where we can do plays and rep. Cause most of the time we're all working at the same time and I can't go see Fedna, like I wanna go see Fedna, et cetera, et cetera. But if we have a building where we can see all of our plays and rep, I think that'd be dope. Oh, maybe that's a theater of the future, that National Black Theater's building. Wink, wink, hint, hint. Um, other things, other other parts of people, that was a shameless good plug. Good job. Good job, Tylee. We didn't plan that, everyone. We did not plan it. Um, Fedna and Diane. Maybe work. I mean, I'm just thinking about what came up before. Uh, I think it was AK, but like, yeah, like what happens when, if people were to walk out of a theater and not have to work? Like just like what happens is like you are sort of supported and resourced in a way that work as we know it, the nine to five, the 40, 50, 60 hours a week did not need to exist. Hmm. Yes, piggybacking off of that, I think that was like financial stability that had no requirements. Like if someone just, wa if we all just walked out and then we're no, like we just knew that everything was fine. I'm so curious to see what people would do, you know, like how they would live, how they would move. Yes, would, um, universal base income. Yes, uh, yes. <laughs> I love that. I love that. So as we round out our time together, we've spent an hour. I feel like we've had such a beautiful convergence of a conversation. So really appreciate it. Um, I think that what Tylee uplifted is actually really important for everyone who's listening in on this is that it actually is important to witness the work, not just hear the conversation or not just to like think that you're going to like witness the work, be curious about who Ty Lee is as a, as a playwright, go get their plays. Um, if you, you already unfortunately missed a beautiful production, um, that was happening, um, at, uh, at, uh, with MBT at Chelsea Factory um, called The Gospel Woman. But there will be more and there will be more opportunities to engage with this work, so engage. Um, witness the work that Diane's doing. Um, look them up on social media. Look, the ticker is going because my team is on it. So, so like get to know who Diane is, get to know Diane's work, engage with Diane's work, fall in love with Diane's work. That's important. Witness or don't, but witness it. I think that's the more important part, witness and engage. Um, I think also witnessing the work of Fedna. Um, uh, go see Ain't No Mo. See her, see her as a player, see her as an actor, also see her as a playwright, right? Come see Black Mother Lost Daughter. See the dichotomy of who someone is, I think is important. So check out Fedna, check out who Fedna is, and check out who AK is. Um, being able to engage with the work that AK is doing, give, engage with the work that AK is theorizing about, uh, growing, maturing, and planting seeds for, that's deeply important and deeply necessary to help move the conversation forward or how we envision a new future. And then lastly, check out National Black Theater. I mean, you know, MBT in the house, we got stuff to do. Um, we are going to be, how we have, we are housing these artists in such a powerful season um, called Love, A Ritual of Repair. Um, and it's an opportunity for us to really think about the ways in which we might need repair. We need to imagine what repair looks like and really, and really uh, making a promissory note through these creative, beautiful love notes. Um, these love letters that these artists have actually pinned um, how we can support them. Um, I think exactly the way that Fedna kind of articulated, we can create the conditions for them to pin craziness in, the, in their plays so that they can feel comforted and feel protected and feel guided um, so that their craziness is not in their lives. Um, and I think that that's a charge that we're gonna, we're gonna hold ourselves up to, Fedna. Um, and, you can, and you can email me when it's not happening, each and every one of you. Be like, yo, I need some more support here. Where's my, where's my comforted? Where's 
my comforter, my comfortin, my comforta. Um, uh, so without further ado, I want to deeply, deeply say thank you to each and every one of you. I want to thank everyone who was able to stay with us for a, a one minute, two minutes, a whole hour um, to engage with this work. Um, I definitely want to say coming up right next for MBT is Amani by AK. Um, it will be happening at Rattlestick. It's a co-production of Rattlestick. Come check it out. Josiah Davis, who is our director and uh, our I am Soul director and resident, um, will be will be uh, helming um, the show. Um, but they, it's a beautiful, gorgeous love note, and then from that love note, we get to build to Diane's work with Bernard's daughter, and then from that love note, we get to we get to land into as closing out our season's workshop production for Fedna with Black Mother Lost Daughter. So there is a spectrum of beautiful identities that are being shared on on the American stage. A spectrum of beautiful identities that MBT is investing in. And we're inviting you, our community, to now come on the journey with us and help us see the world differently and be inspired by the by the communities, the lives, the ancestors that, that circle need and want to be seen, felt, and heard. Um, so I thank every last one of you for being with us tonight. I want I wish everyone a great holiday season. And until next time, have a wonderful afternoon.